Oregon church for quite a few years. And when I went there, uh, before I went there, the pastor, the previous pastor, he asked if I would come and do a week of revival meetings. And I said, I would be happy to do that. So we made the arrangements and he said, I'm going to have our church in prayer for two months before you come. And he, with the leadership, all the people, see this is the power of, of everybody getting on board with, with prayer. The, the people were of such a mind to say, yes, we need to all be involved in prayer. And so they had a prayer meeting every day of the week, somewhere, whether in a home or at the church, every day of the week. And they were praying for two things. You need to pay attention. They were praying for two things. That people who used to know Jesus would come back, and that people who didn't know Jesus would come and, and accept Jesus for the first time. They were praying for discouraged believers to come back, and they were praying for new believers to come. That was their focus, okay? Two things that they were really praying for. And so as I was preparing my messages, I was keeping that in mind. So when the first uh, meeting began, it was on a Saturday night. And um, in that meeting, the, the church was fan-shaped. There were four sections. And over here, there was an aisle in the middle. So in the section on this side of the main aisle, in the back, sat Tony with his grandma and his mom. So remember, Matthew 7, 7, ask, seek, and knock. you got to do your part. So they're praying for these things, but they're all doing their part. They're sending out literature, flyers. They're talking to people. Come to these meetings, you know. And uh, they're, they're talking to their family and friends. Come to these meetings. They're doing everything they can do to help that prayer be answered. So that first night, Tony was there because his grandmother, whom he dearly loved, said, Tony, please you got to come to these meetings just for me, please, for the, at least the first one. And he said, okay, he would do it for her. So now Tony and Larry and Doug had all grown up together in that community. They were as tight as peas in a pod, and you could not separate them. If they did something good, they all did it together. If they got into trouble, they all got into trouble together. Everything they did was together, and they nicknamed them the Three Musketeers, all right? And, uh, and it was sort of a sort of a proverb in that church. Well, that the three musketeers did that, and everybody knew who they were talking about, you know. So they went to a, uh, grade school together at the Christ, at the Adventist grade school. They went to the Adventist academy together. They graduated together. They all worked in the same Albany area, stayed in touch, did a lot of things together. I mean, closer than family almost. And uh, but they all left the church together. They all got disgruntled and discouraged, and they all left the church together. So here's Tony. He comes, and he hadn't been in church in like six or seven years at that point. He comes to church because his grandma pleads with him, please come. So Tony shows up. The first night, and I had an altar call every night because that's what the Lord said to do. I had an altar call every night, and at that first altar call, Tony pops out of his seat, and he comes down and receives Christ as his Savior with tears in his eyes. I prayed with him, and there were several others, too. I prayed with him, and uh, the Lord worked a miracle in that young man's life. So he starts talking immediately. He starts talking to Larry and Doug, and he says, you got to come to these meetings. you got you got to come. I've decided to renew my commitment to Jesus. And he says, I want you to come with me. Well, of course, they feel the pressure because they're all tight-knit, you know, but they're, they're hesitant. And Larry said, no, no, Tony, I don't want to. And, and Doug, no, no, Tony, I don't want to, you know, so... So Sunday night, Tony was there too. Monday, he goes to work at Hewlett Packard because in Corvallis, they have this big uh, industrial area and, and Hewlett Packard is, is in there and they make printer cartridges there at, at, at Corvallis. So he's there doing his thing in his cubicle and working with him is a young woman who is a Hindu and she's busy working along with him. And uh, she says that during the morning, of Monday, she turns to Tony and she says, Tony, what's up with you today? And he said, what do you mean? What do you mean what's up with me? She said, there's something different about you. You're, you're happy. She said, I haven't ever seen you this happy. What's going on? Did you meet a girl? And that's what she said to him. Did you meet a girl? And he goes, no, it's, I didn't meet a girl. And he, she said, well, something's up. I can tell. You got to tell me. What is it? And he said, well, I know you're a Hindu, okay? And I, you're probably not going to understand what I'm about to tell you, but you asked, so I'm going to tell you. And so he, he told her how he had given his life to Jesus, and now Jesus was living in his heart, and that was making him so happy. And she looked at him, and she said, 
you're right, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. He said, well, why don't you come to the meeting tonight and find out? She said, okay, I will. So Monday night, she comes to the meeting. When she walks in the front door of the church, into the foyer, Tony said she took about three steps into the, into the foyer of the church, and she stopped still. Tony said she stood as still as a, ta a statue, put her hands out like this, and she was looking up like this, and she goes, Tony, what is that? And he said, what do you mean, what is that? She said, I feel something. I've never felt it before. What is that? He said, describe it to me. And she said, well, it feels good, feels warm, feels loving. He said, that's Jesus. Jesus is in this place. He said, these people know Jesus. These people love Jesus. These people are praying to Jesus. And you are in a place where Jesus is, and that's what you feel. And she turned to him and she said, I like that very much. She was very serious. She said, I like that very much. And they came in and they sat down. She sat down, he, he always sat in that back pew, so she sat down there with him. When I made the altar call that night, she popped out of her seat like popcorn in an air popper, just boom, you know, just popped right out of her seat, came forward, and that Hindu girl gave her life to Jesus that night. <laughs> What was the church praying? They were praying for two things. What was it? The first one was that discouraged people would come back. The second one was that new people would come, and that prayer was being answered every single night. And in that series of meetings was when that lady with the scoliosis was healed. The Lord straightened her back, took away a tumor that was on her leg, and she was, every time I ever talked to her ever since, she always praises God for that miracle in her life. The Lord also healed two or three other people during that series uh, because that church was so committed to prayer and they were so committed to loving people the way Jesus loved people. And so uh, on Wednesday night of that week, Larry goes to his home. He, he has his own apartment. Doug has his own apartment. So does, you know, so does Tony. So he goes to his mom and dad's home because he's a single young adult and we all know that single young adults have a, a ton of stuff still at their parents' house. And so, <laughs> so he goes to his mom and dad's house because there's something there that he wants that they have in storage at their house. He knocks on the door. His dad comes to the door. Larry, what's up? He says, I want to get such and such. I forget what it is now that he wanted. And, and his dad said, well, Larry, I have no idea where that is. Your mom is the only one who would know where that is, and she's not here. She's at the meeting at the church. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Tony's been going to those meetings. He told me all about it. Well, I'll go find mom, and, and I'll... I'll find out where it is. So he goes down to the church. He gets there at the, at the end of the meeting. We have just had the altar call. People have come forward. People were coming forward every night. And they and, and he came, for, you know, the people came forward that night for prayer. When he looks through the windows of the door, you know how four years are. you got doors and the windows and the doors. And he looks through the window of the door, and he sees people down front. And to him, it looks like they're talking. He goes, oh, the meeting's over. So he opens the door. He goes walking down to get to where his mom and grandma are, and then he realizes that everybody's praying. So he stops, you know, he may not want to go to church, but he's not disrespectful, so he stops. He's not, he's not gonna interrupt anybody. And when we finally, I had the closing prayer, and when I said amen, I immediately hear this shrieking over here to my left, because his mom and his grandma were over here with another lady that they had brought to the meeting, and that lady gave her life to Jesus. And so they're praying with her at that meeting, and, and Larry comes up, and they turn, and here's Larry, and the mom and grandma put him in a big old sandwich hug, and they start crying and shrieking, oh, Larry, Larry, we've been praying for you that you would give your life to Jesus, and here you are. You've come forward in the meeting, and we're so grateful for your decision. And tears streaming down their cheeks, and, and he looks up at me, and he's got that deer in the headlights look, you know, it's like... What happened to me, <laughs> you know? And they're just squeezing him and rejoicing, and everybody else is crowding around, patting him on the back. Oh, Larry, we're so glad. A lot of us have been praying for you. Thank you. Oh, we're so grateful. Praise God. And they're going on and on. And Larry's walking walking from the altar out down you know, with the aisle with mom on one elbow and grandma on the other elbow. And he told me later, he said, for years I knew that I needed to give my life to Jesus. He said, but I, did, I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off. And he said, when I saw my mom's love for me and my grandma's love for me and everybody else pat me on the back and how they were praying for me and the tears in their eyes, he said, I said to myself, well, what better moment could there be than now? 
to give my life to Jesus. So between the altar and the back door, he gave his life to Jesus. So then he starts talking to Doug, and, 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 and Tony's talking to Doug, and they're, they're trying to get Doug to come to the meeting. Doug never came to the meeting. A month later, I had a week of prayer at Milo Academy, <laughs> and I called up Doug and Larry, uh, uh, no, not Doug, but I called up Tony and Larry, and I said, hey, any chance you guys have any time that you could come to Milo, because they were alumnus of Milo, and I said, any, any chance you could come to Milo and share your testimony with the young people and tell them what God has done for you? And man, Tony jumped all over that. He said, I'll take the whole week off. He said, I'll come for the whole week if that's okay. I said, yeah, I'd love to have your help for the whole week. And Larry said he'd do the same thing. So, and then Larry says, when I talked to him, he said, can we bring Doug? I said, well, who's Doug? He said, well, he's our friend. Uh, you know, yeah, he, he would come if you, if you were okay with that. And I said, yeah, let him come. Well, I had just told them that I wanted them to come and share their testimony. So when they say, can Doug come too? I'm assuming that he's a Christian young man who will sh also share his testimony. So they all come. Friday night comes, first meeting. I'm giving the rundown of everything, sharing how everything's going to go. And I told them every night we're going to have a testimony. And I said, I've got several people lined up to give testimonies. And I said, tonight, and I looked, and Doug was sitting on the front row with Larry and Doug, or Larry and Tony. And I, I looked at Doug and I said, Doug, I haven't heard your testimony. Why don't you come up and share your testimony? <laughs> and he gave me the same look that Larry had given me that, like, what? You know? And, uh, but he gets up from the pew and he starts walking up. And I'm thinking to myself, I, he's a little shy. You know, I'm thinking he's, he's a little bit scared to talk to everybody. That's what I thought. I didn't know he was working out things with God that very moment. He told me later that between the pew and the pulpit, he decided to give his life to Jesus. Amen. That's why I call it converted by mistake. But he gave a powerful testimony that night, and there were many young lives that were changed that week because of the ministry of those young men and other people like them. But why did all that happen? It was because there were people who really believed and were committed to prayer they had faith and they looked forward with anticipation that God was going to answer their prayers. Amen. They worked that way. They lived Amen. that way. And God is no favorite. He doesn't show favoritism. He will do the same thing for you, whether it's here or Maine, John. He will do the same thing for you. Have faith. Be, believe that God wants to work through you. Pray for people. Did you know that 89% of the people, that's the exact number, 89% of the people in North America said, when they, were, when they were surveyed by George Barna and his organization, they said that they would welcome prayer if someone offered to pray for them. Mm -hmm. One of the things you could do is go from house to house and just say, hey, my name is, I live at, and I have a burden on my heart to pray and care for people in my community, and I don't want to push anything on you, but I just wanted to let you know that if there's something that you would like me to pray about, I will be happy to do that. I've done that many times, and I've never been refused. Yeah. People always have something, and they will say, I have cancer, I have this, or I, my daughter, or my son, or my, my finances, or, and they'll tell you. And, and I've prayed with them right on the spot, and I'm telling you, most of the time, tears show up and trickle down their cheeks. People are so hungry for somebody to care and, to, and they want to believe in God. How many people live in Curlew? How, uh, this whole area, how many people do you think? How many? Our mailing um, in Melo was 200, and when we mailed to every mailbox in Curlew, it was 500. Okay. Now that's household. So that's 700 altogether. Right? That's just a household. Okay, 700. So let's just say, let's just stick with 700. That means 70 people in this community are ready to give their life to Jesus today. That's a fact. 70 people in this community are ready to give their life to Jesus today. The only caveat being, they need to hear it from somebody they trust. That's the only thing. 70 people in this community are waiting for somebody to care about them. And this is true all over the United States. The, the Billy Graham Evangelical Association did a six year study about this going door to door all over North America. And they discovered that every community they went to, that 10% of the people they talked to were ready to give their life to Jesus that day. That means there's 70 people here just waiting for you to show some love and care to them personally. 
and to invite them to accept Jesus as their Savior. All right, so uh, I want you to consider this real quick. Uh, the prayers of Abraham saved his family. Are you with me? The prayers of Ab Abraham saved his family. The prayers of Job saved his friends. The prayers of Moses saved an entire nation. And the prayers of Jesus saved the world. Your prayers will make a difference too. John, would you have our closing prayer?